So good afternoon and welcome everyone. Welcome to this uh, discussion forum, Singing Welcome in the Hymn Society. It's been such a truly rich day and week so far, and I'm so grateful uh, to be in community and be in conversation with all of you. Hi, Chi! <laughs> and uh, I really look forward to, to this discussion with this really remarkable group of people. Uh, my name is Hilary Donaldson. I, uh, my pronouns are she and her, and I am speaking to you from Toronto, Canada. I am president-elect of the Hymn Society, and I would like to first uh, introduce uh, the the friends who will be in conversation with me this afternoon as we turn the question of singing welcome question mark uh, to our own hymn society and um, ask some uh, important questions uh, of ourselves and each other. So first I'd like to uh, introduce my uh, the, the friends on my panel today. So first is uh, Dr. Lisa Hancock. Lisa is a music minister. <laughs> That was Adam. Lisa is a music minister and scholar based in Dallas, Texas, and uh, she recently defended her doctoral dissertation, Jesus Christ, Revelation of Love, a Christology of the Disabled Christ. Lisa and her husband, Reverend Justin Hancock, jointly lead an organization called The Julian Way, which explores examples of intentional Christian community for all of God's expressions of physical embodiment. Lisa, thank you for being here. Also, we have Saya Ojiri, who is a composer and church musician working in many ecumenical contexts, including uh, having done work with the World Council of Churches. And she has just submitted her doctoral dissertation in liturgical studies at Emmanuel College, University of Toronto. And congratulations on that incredible uh, accomplishment, Saya. She's an active member of, of both the Hymn Society in the US and Canada and the Hymn Society in Japan and has contributed scholarship to the hymn. Many of you will recognize her as having been the leader of a wonderful evening event, last year's conference, interviews with Asian congregational song leaders. Thank you, Saya, for being here today. Um, also here is Dr. Adam Perez. Adam is a specialist in history and theology of praise and worship. He recently defended his, I'm really big on people and their dissertations lately. <laughs> That's because I just finished mine uh, and also because it's great. Uh, he recently defended his doctoral dissertation, uh, which is titled All Hail King Jesus, the International Worship Symposium and the Making of Praise and Worship History, uh, and is taking up a postdoctoral history, a postdoctoral position at Duke Divinity School. And he serves as a member at large on the executive. Thanks for being here, Adam. And it's also um, my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Lisa Weaver, Reverend Dr. Lisa, Lisa Weaver, who is a pastor, preacher, and liturgist, and who serves as assistant professor of worship at Columbia Theological Seminary. Uh, and Lisa is taking up a position this week as a member at large uh, on the Hymns Society Executive, for which we're so grateful, Lisa. Uh, Lisa is a native New Yorker and an ordained minister in the American Baptist Churches USA and served on the committee for the recent African-American ecumenical hymnal, One Lord, One Faith, One Baptism from GIA 2018. And Dr. Weaver is adept at inciting communities to reimagine worship in more theological and inclusive ways. Uh, and Adam is showing it off <laughs> on camera. <laughs> show that, show that hymnal to us, Adam. You, that one, that's the one. <laughs> it's my raise the roof sort of, like, <laughs> yes. Lisa, thank you so much for being in conversation with us today. Um, and I'd like to uh, remind all of you, we're in webinar format, of course, so you're, you're watching the panel uh, have this discussion uh, among ourselves, but we also would like you to be part of the conversation because you are a part of the wider conversation about what does the second hundred years of the Hymn Society in the US and Canada look like. So I invite you to... Um, share what you're thinking in the chat and you can use the q a function uh, to specifically ask questions of the panelists or of myself and i'll be keeping an eye on those as we as we uh have our conversation so thank you friends um i just want to uh locate us in this topic a little bit so uh as we've been hearing uh the the theme of of this week is 
singing welcome question mark and what does that mean what does welcome look like uh and how how is it based on context and how welcoming are we? And we wanted, we, we thought we'd be remiss uh, to not turn that question on ourselves uh, as the, the people who make up the hymn society. Um, thinking through these questions, I was thinking about, can the hymn society ask a question of itself? It's a, it's a organization, but uh, regardless, um, what does that look like? And so, we are here to have a chat about the ways that the hymn society has um there there are some ways already that the hymn society has examined areas of weakness areas of lack of expertise in recent years um as we strive toward a more perfect welcome in order to draw a wider circle or perhaps erase to borrow from adam tice mm. uh some of this work has uh some of this ongoing work has related to our leadership who we invite into positions of leadership and how we imagine those roles. Some of this work has related to our practices of welcoming all God's people more and more fully, whether that pertains to sexual orientation, gender identity, race, and growing our understanding of how various identities interact and the importance of understanding um, that uh, intersectionality. Some of this work has also related to styles of music and worship, singing more fully into our expressions of the church's song. Um, and this week has shown the richness of those learning opportunities continuing to unfold. Um, Jorge Lockwood's opening evening event allowed us to sing into the marvelous economy of God, while also acknowledging the difficulty and complexity of welcome, as Jorge said. And Slat's tool just a couple of hours ago led us through an enormously informative session on the implications of congregational song and gendered language. And the kind of rethinking and reframing that Slat's invited us into uh, resonates in many ways with Reverend Dr. Margaret Amer's discussion uh, claim that to worship in the spirit of Pentecost is to preach that we are not the center of the church, that decentering always requires asking questions and sometimes sitting with the uncomfortable implications of those questions. So what I'd like to ask of each of you, and uh, I'd love it if each of you would give an answer to this first one. Um, in organizations or communities where you yourself feel welcome, what are the common threads? What does welcome look like and feel like and sound like to you? Saya, I'd love to know what you think. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this session. I'm so grateful. So I, I'm Japanese, so I'm going to speak from my own cultural perspective. Um, so in our culture, welcome is an action or a behavior rather than a concept. So many Asian cultures are high context cultures, which means that people tend to be more indirect and implicit and less verbal or nonverbal in, in their communication. So just saying welcome is actually not enough to show our welcome and hospitality. So therefore, it's highly important for us to welcome people by actions and behavior, such as sharing food or giving gifts or entertaining by uh, performances or even just sitting together and talking together. So it's all about behavior. So these actions are expected to be hospitable in our cultural context. So to me, welcome is not about what we think or say, but it's about what we do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Saya. Lisa Weaver, what do you think? I, um, my response, it might um, bleed into a, a response later on and pulling on my English teacher background, if you know me for more than 10 minutes, you know I love alliterations. And so the three things that come to mind are art, articulation, and action. Um, things that make me feel welcome are when spaces are hospitable. Um, does the artwork reflect more than one ethnic group or one group period, right? 
what are the particularities of the art now and I understand the problems with that right we don't we can't go in institutions and change things but there are there are ways in which environment um, can be thought of more intentionally um, and and articulation um, and and simply said it is it's as simple as speaking to someone you know is not in that context. Um, many times I've walked into contexts and uh, different contexts and you know you're new there and everyone else knows you're new there and no one talks to you, right? And and so, I mean, just those simple actions and I'm not going to, to spend time getting into the psychodynamics of why people speak and don't speak, right? I mean, I think there are implications as for Christians, for Christian communities. Uh, that may or may not come up later, but but to but to to articulate welcome and action, um, and something that may go far afield from this is, we talk about singing welcome, and I I, I draw a line between singing and mission, and if we sing welcome and if we do all of these things inside, and none of it carries outside, that that is a question that we need to raise about the power and the impact of our singing on the inside. Well said, Lisa, thank you. We have two Lisas. Lisa H, what are your thoughts? I found this to be a really helpful question just to start putting the threads together for myself around this topic. I think as a member of a disabled family, welcome looks and feels and sounds like expectation and adaptation is kind of the words that I'll use. Mm -hmm. um, some of the most welcoming, both physical and attitudinal spaces and organizations that my family and I have encountered are those that both expect people with disabilities to be there and adapt to the reality of diverse embodiments in those spaces. And that's whether it's physical, online, or some kind of hybrid, right? Um, I think expectation, well, let me say, so we talk in the disability community about physical accessibility and attitudinal accessibility. And because we're talking in a Christian faith community, I would add theological accessibility, something that makes it possible for all people to interact with one another physically, attitudinally, and theologically. And so expectation for me means that whatever the space is expects people with disabilities to be there, whether they currently are or not. Because there's nothing worse than coming into a space and everyone's really surprised to have somebody with a disability there. And suddenly they try to problem solve your presence there. Like presences don't need to be problems. So expecting people with disabilities is kind of a way of shifting that from problem solving into adaptation. So for me, like that adaptation often looks like um, rather than trying to accommodate. So we, the non-disabled organization, are going to be able to do this for the disabled people that are here. Adaptation for me is this mutual joining and listening and caring, both kind of on the fly, because sometimes you have to do it on the fly, but also kind of a deeper willingness to enter into conversation to figure out how do non-disabled and disabled bodies adapt to being good community together which is also kind of a de I love this language of decentering, right? The decentering of anybody being an expert of anything other than their own bodies and experiences and letting those our expertises in ourselves come together and kind of converse. And so I think those are kind of the key things that when I come into spaces church or otherwise, it's really clear when some of that work has been done and it's also really clear when it hasn't. No doubt. I would really like to come back to a couple of the threads of what both Lisa's have have raised along with Saya. So I, I keep some of those threads in the air, friends. Um, but Adam, I would like to know what you think about this question, just since it's a while since I said it. What uh, in in other avenues where you have felt welcome or you feel welcome, what are the common threads? What does welcome look, feel and or sound like to you? Yeah, thanks. And thanks for the 
the word of testimony already here on, on the topic. Um, uh, on this question, my mind is is uh, brought to to an epistle, <laughs> and uh, just the the general uh, sense of um, someone bearing witness, uh, bearing testimony on behalf of another, and this uh, for me this sense of being um, sent and being received uh, have been probably the, some of the most meaningful, um, yeah, meaningful ways in which I've felt welcomed. And I think uh, you know when I sort of self psychoanalyze here, I think what, um, what happens in those moments is perhaps that, um, I get the sense that I know I'm supposed to be there and, um, any sort of obstacles or challenges, uh, are, uh, I can adapt to them perhaps in the sense that I know that my, my place here is not in question. Um, you know, I have this sort of like baseline of, um, of, uh, confidence about my own presence in a space and, uh, and that being achieved by being, yeah, sort of sent and received uh, and thinking of, um, particularly, um, ways in which, you know, when, when some new comes into, a um, uh, a space, how we know, like sort of their story of, of how they've come to be here and whether we know someone is sending them to us in particular, or they have a story of being sent somewhere and they found their way to us, uh, but acknowledging and receiving them on that story and then carrying them uh, more deeply into the space. Uh, I love the sort of conference buddy idea um, that, you know, you, you have, you have a home base, you know, you're part, you know, you, you're invited into the story because someone is telling a story on your behalf as it's wound up with the story of this larger organization, right? Like there's something for me that that's like, okay, yeah, my, I, by extension of myself, I know, or, or by extension of my story being, uh, being wrapped into this other story, I know that I'm welcome in, in this other space. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I have to say about that uh, experience. Thank you, Adam. And uh, thank all, thank you all. Uh, just before I move on to sort of my next, my bigger topic question area. I want to pull at some of those threads that that I just heard uh, emerge. Um, what I'm hearing immediately is um, a real awareness of the gap between um, ideas of welcome uh, and action toward welcome. Um, Lisa Weaver, you've drawn a line between, uh, and maybe you can unpack this for us a bit, but a line between uh, singing and mission uh, and um, Lisa Hancock, the, the difference between um, expectation versus what, what you encounter uh, uh, in, in actual fact, uh, and Saya as well, you know, the, the notion that um, in cultures that are uh, in high context cultures, in, in your own cultural experience, there's uh, just to say welcome uh, is, is inadequate, it, it falls short. Um, so what are what are the some what are some of the ways that we can bring uh, close that gap? <laughs> How what are some positive steps that can be taken? Um, and again, more broadly, it can be from your own experience um, of how that of how that gap gets um, narrowed. When I when I raise the point about singing and mission, we often oftentimes people tend to think this is Sunday, this is in the building and this is the rest of my life. And when in fact, the words we sing actually indict, implicate and, and put us in covenant with what we sing. Mm -hmm. And so to understand, yes, we're singing because we want and believe in this inclusive community, but we can't leave here and not embody what we've just sung. Right, and so, and and there's not a way to measure that. I mean, most congregations, you know, you don't, you may or may not, I mean, statistical probabilities notwithstanding, have people work at the same job, right? We don't have somebody like with a microscope seeing how we live our lives if we've lived this out, but there, mm. but there should be a way that that's communicated, that we sing and singing implicates us. If we, uh, if we say these words, you know, uh, um, whatever they are, I can't think of a, a good hymn example right now. But when we talk about singing about our neighbor, about caring for other people, about about doing these things, about living Christ, like we're making a statement. We're not only singing vertical, vertically, 
Mm. right to God, right? We're not, we sing on a horizontal plane, but it's not just singing. That singing implicates us. And it implicates us to the mission that we live outside and that what happens inside should inform what we do outside. And, you know, and there's a fluidity and not this bifurcation of singing and then I live the rest of my life, if that makes sense. It does. I, uh, just to um, talk about filling in the gap a little bit, and I just, I actually think this implication, I, I mean, I love this, that singing implicates us, Lisa Weaver, um, because I think that, I think that part of filling in the gap for me between ideas of welcome and, I wanna make sure I get your language right, between ideas of welcome and, um, action of welcome, perhaps, does start with, um, in my experience, this sense of I am being implicated and I am doing my own, like I am doing my work and I am doing it within the community, which means that the community also, like how does, how does the community draw together to do the work of being humbled to receive and then mutually act together. Um, mm. And I think, I think one, like one small example of how this works, it, how it has worked for my family, um, because, I, and I, it's also really important to acknowledge there are non-apparent disabilities that don't just enter into spaces and are known as, as disabilities, and I'd be happy to talk about that. But I think there's, in my instance, my family comes into a space and it's very clear that there's disability involved. Hmm. and. So I think one of the shifts that I've gotten, like, that's good, that I've gotten to experience in a community is a community that says, we are welcoming, and yet we have an elevator that doesn't always work, and we have a space where I, we don't know where this is, you know, we don't know where your equipment's going to go mm. and all of this, but we're willing to stop and figure it out week by week. And we're willing to do what's needed because we think your presence is important and we're not going to stick your wheelchair behind a post, which is really common. So I think there's like, those seem like really small things, but they start the process mm -hmm. of embodying the physical that eventually gets us into the conversations about the attitudinal and the theological accessibility. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Lisa. And because we're sort of um, moving in this direction, actually, I think I'm going to use this as an opportunity to, um, so I'll ask broadly my second question, but I'm going to come immediately back to you, Lisa. Um, my second question is uh, for all panelists, what is a lesson about inclusion and equity from another aspect of your work and ministry um, that you think would be valuable for the HIM Society to hear? And in a way, we're already having this conversation, but I'll just state it outright. Um, and Lisa, I'd love to hear in a little more detail about uh, your work through the Julian Way uh, and uh, yeah, helping to, to help us to think through <laughs> that a little bit more. Yeah. Absolutely. So part of the work of the Julian Way is empowering persons with disabilities into leadership within the church through intentional community and discipleship and things. And um, my husband really likes to say that he is like the hands-on and I am the thinking, which is not an actually good bifurcation. We are thinking <laughs> together, but he likes to let me talk about um, some of the the deep theological stuff that he just kind of, he, he he's very good at embodying. Um, and so when I was thinking through this question, one of the things I was reminded of was actually something from Julian of Norwich which she has this statement as she's talking about the body of Christ, that we are enclosed within the wounded body of Christ. We, the church, we, the people of God, are enclosed within his wounded body. And for us in the Julian way, this has actually been a really profound, um, a really profound image that we use to think through what does it mean to be not just the body of Christ, but to be enclosed as the disabled body of Christ. And how does that start us toward thinking with singing and doing and evangelizing and being mission in the world as the disabled 
body of Christ. Whether we are individually identifying as disabled or non-disabled, we come together in love through the disabled Christ. And so then what that does, I think, is it invites us to grow into that identity, right? And, and that means then that equity and inclusion for us is how are we growing into our identity as the disabled Christ and how does that then bear fruit as equity and inclusion in our organizations and in our world because we're starting to recognize that all of society's standards of normalcy and power and validity of bodies aren't true. They don't bear up against the disabled body of Christ. So, I mean, the word of caution there always when we're working with churches is, okay, if we're going to go on that journey, we can't give you a one-size-fits-all answer. We can tell you that equity and inclusion is fruit, and we can invite you into an improvisation of sorts with this idea and with the Holy Spirit, and let's find out where that takes you as a community. So I hope that answers your question. But um, It does, Lisa. Thank you so much. And um, I... What what I'm thinking as you're describing all of these things is that, you know, we are engaged in particularly in this new normal, not so post COVID context where we find ourselves and we find ourselves in a in a second year of a virtual um, hymn society conference looking at what next year and beyond looks like. Um, I think this is has sparked a conversation that abled people have had the privilege of not examining very closely what the disabled community have been asking for for ages and ages, which is look how much we can actually do. Um, yeah, via these technologies that already existed, but we weren't utilizing to their full effect. Um, and I think churches are probably, I think there's many people watching who are asking these questions in their in their ministries and and looking at what reopening looks like whatever stage of reopening you might be at um and thinking about this before uh, we started, I, I was reminded of a really fabulous blog post that Reverend Miriam Spees of the United Church of Canada posted. Uh, it might even be a year ago now <laughs> um, that the title was, uh, and uh, Brian, don't scramble, I have the URL, but it's uh, COVID exposed Christian ableism, what happens when churches reopen. Just, you know, keeping the spotlight on uh, the idea that there so many accommodations have have appeared <laughs> um during this time and and do we just go well that was that was cool and and move on or do we do we make that an important part of uh of moving forward i've been so gratified to hear the conversations that the executive committee have had around how important it is that we have had so much engagement with such a wider um you know, reflection of the society through that, which I think is wonderful. Um, and, you know, for my own self, there were there were areas of weakness of my understanding. And I'm ashamed to say it was when I became a parent and had a stroller everywhere that I began to really be confronted by stairs and, um, and things. So I, th I say that to say that I think um, what you are signaling, um, as well as as uh, the other panelists, and that also relates to what Slats was saying earlier today around uh, ideas of gender, our need to think through language carefully and what it means for people who don't conform necessarily to uh, a strict binary gender. The, the grace that um, people in these marginalized positions are showing, those of us who don't fall into those, those uh, categories or identities, the grace, the burden of wisdom and teaching and grace seems always to fall to people from from more marginalized uh, communities. So I, uh, I'm feeling grateful this week to uh, learn so much. And I hope that um, we can be be leaders in continuing to learn uh, is is what I'm trying to get at. <laughs> um, and uh, I'd also just just before um, before I ramble anymore, uh, other panelists, do you have any further thoughts about this topic area? The idea of lessons, even anecdotes that uh, we can learn in the hymn society from from uh, uh, from your experience. 
I, I wanted to underscore what Lisa H said. Um, and one of the things that I appreciate, and it, it's, a, it's a note that I wrote, um, is to be transparent and use your words. Um, to say so, sometimes things, if you don't have a sign, it is helpful for whoever is in liturgical leadership to just use words to welcome people. We don't have to write big speeches, um, but just to let people know that all are welcome or to say, we are working on making our space more friendly. You know, please give us your suggestions on how we can do that, right? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't require a committee, right? We don't have to vote on it. <laughs> Right, it, it could be something, but even the language, when we talk about singing welcome, and I'm gonna talk about words broadly, even to say, you know, we're in this place, but we do see and we do know, that goes a long way. That really does go a long way. So I just wanted to underscore that, that point as well. And also, and Lisa mentioned it, to underscore the point of raising invisible disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, people have sensory disabilities. People have light disabilities. People have um, you know, intolerances for incense, right? So things we can't see. So there are really super expansive ways that we need to think about inclusion. And it, and it, it, um, it causes us to examine our privilege and our preference. Thank and, you. Yes. It's privilege and it's preference. And, and to, to say, and then I'm going to stop talking, um, you know, the first thing that people will say is we can't afford, right? Because to be, to be expansive and inclusive is an investment. But if we're going to be the body of Christ, we, can, we have to stop saying we can't afford. The question is, how can we afford? Mm -hmm. It's how do we afford? because we can't say no to other people in the body of Christ with integrity. And I'm gonna stop. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just processing what you just said. <laughs> it was so good. Somebody write it down. <laughs> um, thank you, friends. So now let's think a little bit about how the song of the hymn society, what we're singing, looks different than it did maybe 5, 10, 15 years ago? And how might it look in our second century? So how are we singing a deeper and wider welcome in the hymn society now than previously? Adam, I'd love to, to hear what you think about this. Yeah, thanks. Um, in this kind of, speaking of feeling welcome, in this context, I always feel like a little bit of an underdog in the sense that uh, my area of uh, formation and expertise is a song tradition um, that now uh, estimates are a quarter of the world's Christians uh, are, are part of this praise and worship, contemporary praise and worship to kind of use the most expansive version of the phrase as possible. And, um, you know, I, in some of my own, my own, out of my own interest, my own work, um, thinking about how a uh, sort of wave of the, in the second half of the 20th century. Okay. I'm not going to get too far off my, off my, uh, off my prompt here, but in the second half of the 20th century, right. You have all these mainline traditions publishing new hymnals, right? So um, you go and look at these hymnals and you see this expansion toward uh, global song in some cases uh, and a in a few cases, an openness toward contemporary praise and worship, um, but one thing that I notice about it, and I see the, and, and to answer your question, I see us moving, I see the big conversation moving and the practice moving um, in the last few years in ways that it hasn't before, which is that um, we've had this problem with proximity. Uh, global song is far away. It feels far away. It, uh, and it is perhaps accessible because of its, the lack of proximity. Praise and worship in many congregations is happening next door. And, uh, and finding a place for other song traditions that are not, that don't carry with it the sense of exoticism, but are built into some of the conflicts we've already had, um, or are still having, uh, not to presume that's in the past, um, is harder. It's, I mean, just the, the language of, you know, the, the, the problem of, of proximity, just that, that I think we're, we finally started to like turn the ship far enough where it's noticeable to me, at least as a, as one person that, um, there is welcome for, uh, this other song tradition. That's now a dominant song tradition that doesn't go by the name, the hymn, 
but that our, our sort of broader turn in mission toward, uh, toward the congregation's songs and wh whatever those might be in the expansive sense, um, you know, seeing that turn happening in the last few years with those who've been invited uh, to lead and the different kinds of um, uh, breakout session type uh, events, I, that, that brings me hope in, in that the, the conversation is going to happen uh, or is continue to happen in ways that are, um, are not built on our the challenges of, of proximity and the, the prejudice around that. And also just the secondary aspect, which is that global Christians are singing praise and worship more than they're singing uh halle, halle, halle. You know, uh so just just to name that as like a reality, uh what the scope and and uh and sense of what the church at large is singing. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, I always uh really appreciated something that uh, Pablo Sosa said, sort of querying the very uh, well, well used term global music. And he would say, if our music, like music of the global South or of Argentina, if our music is global, what's yours? <laughs> Where do you think your music is from? But yeah, thank you for that. Um, sort of to to shift this question a little bit toward where we're headed, I'd like to ask Saya, um, all of you really, but I'm wondering more broadly, what would make the music of the hymn society? How can we, how can we sing more welcome in future? How can we sing into wider welcome uh, in future? Saya, uh, I'd love to know what you think. Yep. Um, I think if we try to make our singing more welcoming, um, it's important to go beyond singing. So uh, yeah, from my experience, most participants at the hymn society are great singers and wonderful musicians. They can do anything, like many of them can sing, sight read and, and make harmonies, but, but in real churches, there are lots of people who are not singers or who are not confident in singing or who prefer not to sing or who can't sing because of age or or disease or disability. So how can we invite and welcome those people to the hymn society, particularly hymn, hymn festivals? Yeah, so I was thinking. So in my church as a music director, I sometimes provide more options to my congregation. For example, I invite them to clap their hands or uh, do some body movements or like little dancing or um, hand signs or sometimes I give them little, a little percussion instruments like uh, um, tambourines or shakers so that they can participate in congregational song in different ways. Yeah, so I think the hymn society would become more welcoming and, and accessible to all kinds of people if we use such kind of strategies like non verbal participation. And this non-verbal participation can also help people whose language is not English. Yeah, so I think some, yeah, but some people have already done, done that. I, I saw some people doing in the hymn society, but I think more can be done in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Saya. So you're inviting us into, uh, I think, a, a wider, maybe more dynamic practice of what making music together sounds like. Thank you. Um, I would love this conversation to be five hours long, but I, I am going to move on to my next question, which is who is not at the table in our gatherings, whether in person or virtual and in the wider work of the hymn society, whether that's our workshops, our publications, our staff, our executive committee, whose perspectives have we not yet made room for? And I'm happy for anyone to respond. And I also welcome uh, your thoughts in the chat and I'm keeping an eye on the Q&A as well if anyone wants to share any questions at all. Um, I'm happy to just speak to this briefly and I think it actually comes back to a point that Lisa Weaver made that I really appreciate which is the reality of non-apparent or invisible disabilities. Um, because the reality is, 
even with those of us who are gathered right now, like one in five adults in the U.S. or in the in Canada, and one in four adults in the U.S. have some disability or combination of disabilities. So, like statistically, we already have people with disabilities gathered with us. I think the question that I would ask is, and and I ask it gently and honestly, and I don't have an expected answer to it. Um, my question is how much are the people already gathered, already in leadership and participating, invited and welcomed to lead with their disability perspective? Or are they encouraged to pass as non-disabled as much as possible? Because that's one of the primary, that's a primary factor just out in the world, is an expectation of passing if you can at all. So I think my question is, how much, one, how much are we encouraging the leading with your disability perspective if that's an important part of you to bring to the table? And also, how much are we expecting disability pride at the table versus disability as only suffering? And this is a really important question for me because I think the more we expect disability pride at the table, the more both new participants and, uh, and current participants are going to be invited to lead out of their, the complexity of their disability experience. Whereas when we only expect disability as suffering or as something negative, we really start, and I think that's part of the pressure to pass as non-disabled, but it also really flattens what we expect out of a disability experience and what that brings to who we are as an organization. Thank you so much, Lisa. And um, it, if I stray into um, territory that I don't you know, have a lot of uh, understanding of, please correct me. But I, I'm really, I'm interested in how you bring up this idea of really bringing your whole self into leadership not flattening that perspective, not being expected to pass. And it strikes me that there is so much to interrogate about the language we use to sing in terms of um, what I understand to be a really pervasive um, issue of um, the tendency to um, romanticize disabled people and to th this sort of um, inspiration porn, to use a really vernacular turn of phrase, um, that I think we can often fall into um, that is is definitely harmful um, to to inviting people and their full selves into leadership. So I really appreciate that perspective. I haven't really asked you a question, but <laughs> that's what you made me think of, and I'm grateful for that. Um, other other uh, thoughts about who who else is not at the table? I'm still processing, but something I think the two things I've seen in the chat that I think think are noteworthy are uh, Native Americans, First, First Nation um, individuals, and, and the conversation around denominations, spectrums. Um, what, I, what I'm reading is the difference with theological stances between Reformed, Calvinist, Presbyterian, um, Episcopal, UCC. One of the things, and I appreciate both of those registrations, one of the things that I appreciate or want to lean on with the denominational piece, it, it's not... It, in addition to being where, where we stand theologically, it is also the difference between free church traditions and traditions that use a book. Um, mm. I don't know the statistics. I don't know what that looks like. I haven't been um, present long enough to kind of have a sense of that, but I know that that is a big divide. And I don't know how, I don't know the areas, or I'd be curious about the areas in which the hymn society could do better at bridging those because oftentimes free church traditions are not um, regarded equally. I'll use the most diplomatic language I can find in terms of what they bring to the body of Christ in terms of music and practice. Thank you, Lisa. And I would, I'd like to speak a little bit to the uh, point about uh, Native American or First Nations involvement and perspectives. Um, I just want to signal that a conversation emerged in our uh, casual gathering yesterday afternoon uh, that I was so grateful for. Um, uh, Hymn Society friends were sort of checking on, on the Canadians of how we're 
doing and responding uh, in in response to, and I'll, I'll give a trigger warning for an upsetting topic, but uh, the the revelation of the discovery of uh, murdered children uh, in unmarked graves at Canadian colonial residential schools, settler residential schools. And it's caused um, a long overdue reckoning with um, settler Canadians understanding of who we are as a nation and the ideas that we, the stories we tell ourselves about who we are as a nation vis-a-vis uh, -vis the um, not cultural genocide, but literal genocidal principles on which our nation was founded at Confederation. Um, and there's a lot that you can read about uh, the Canadian residential schools if you're not sure what I'm talking about. Um, but I really appreciate, um, I think it's Deb Loftus bringing up uh, this question because I think it's one of the uncomfortable questions that we are invited to sit with, particularly going in to our cent particularly in our centenary year and going into uh, an another an a new chapter for the hymn society because um, I, I so enjoyed um, the the Proscuneo uh, evening event last night. It was so wonderful, and I think uh, I say what I'm going to say, um, knowing that I think if you look at their work and the kind of music ministry that I do, there are a lot of resonances. I respect uh, that mode of music ministry so, so deeply. But I was struck by one thing that that was said in the course of the leadership, um, which was encouraging people to engage in, in musical traditions, particularly, you know, an important message for, I think, uh, white Anglo-Saxon people to hear, uh, engaging with musical traditions other than your own. And the, the prompt was really just just take the song and make it your own. And um, I, I really value that perspective. I think it's really important because there are bridges that can be made between uh, experiences and cultures that are, that are really, I think, life-giving. But I'm hearing through more aware settler ears in, in these recent years and to hear the prompt, you know, take the song and make it your own as a settler um, feels very different now than than I maybe felt about it as I was starting my career. You know, we have a colonial history that hymnody has been front and center in of, of reshaping the expressions of, um, you know, we talk about marginalized people, but it's it's settlers and, and colonists who have marginalized those people. And as in the case of the Canadian residential schools, um, erased their lives. So this is this is something we I think need to grapple with. Um, Canada is is asking questions that we haven't asked of one another before, and I think um, examining uh, and sitting with the discomfort of the colonial history of hymnody is is something that we should be prepared to do uh, in the coming years. And I'm uh, really enjoying Becca Whitla's uh, book. Liberation, Decoloniality, and Liturgical Practices, Flipping the Songbird. Uh, she really um, brings such a, a liturgically rich perspective to, to the ideas that I'm talking about. So thank you very much for bringing up that point, uh, Deb and, and Lisa as well. Um, before I can, move on, other can, thoughts about this? Yeah, yeah Adam. Can I just offer one, one um, context-related perspective too is, you know, thinking about who we are individually and the stories that each of us are <laughs> have and share, um, you know, for your ears hearing that invitation as, uh, you know, as in the ears of a, a colonizer, a settler, as opposed to hearing it from the other side, which is an invitation to actually take something and make it your own, not in a way that's coercive or mm -hmm. that's, uh, you know, that carries with it the same kind of weight, but hearing it as an invitation to actually claim something that you haven't been invited to claim before and mm -hmm. not in an exclusionary way or a, a way that's, you know, somehow like precludes someone else being also able and invited to claim it, but um, th that there, there's something else generative happening there in the ears of others of us. And, and, and I want to thank you, Adam, for that. And there's a both and to that because the notion of take something and make it your own presupposes that the person doesn't have something themselves right? That there's not a song that they, they have, right? You find yourself in these contexts, right? And this is the, this is the, the struggle, the lang this is the conversation that we're starting to have about words of welcome and hospitality to presupposition. Well, take this and make it your own, but I actually have something that I could offer to, right? So, so I think just to acknowledge that there could be another way to have the conversation or another lens by which to approach that as well. Grateful. I'm not, 
I'm not saying absolutely. No, I'm saying both and. Thank you. Yes, I think it is both and. Yeah, thank you. I'll put Becca's book title in the chat. Thank you. Other thoughts on this area before I, I ask another question? Oops. So then I will ask, what work do we need to do? And this is, this is dovetailing actually very nicely. What work do we need to do to live into a wider welcome more fully? Put another way, what might we need to let go of to more fully reflect the radical welcome of God? Saya, I'd love to hear your, uh, your thoughts on this. Uh, okay. Um, I'm going to talk about the hymn society. So I think um, welcoming is, of course, important to our members, like friends and well members, but it's more important to uh, outsiders, like guests, visitors, and newcomers. Yeah, because that will make our circle wider. Yeah. And particularly, I think we must care for international guests since they, they spend lots of time and money to fly over and come and join us. And yeah, let me share my experience at the Hymn Society. So in 2017, I invited two Japanese hymn writers from Tokyo and they did a presentation and I was their translator. And then they were well-known hymn writers among the Anglican Church of Japan. Then particularly one of them was uh, the vice president of the Hymn Society of Japan. So he, he was a kind of big name, he was an important person. But um, yeah, however, they were not introduced to the assembly during the conference, Then yeah, which was unfortunate. Then in fact, a, a group from Brazil was introduced on the stage in front of the people, but our guests were not. Then they, they, they were not upset. Like they were, they totally understood. I know people are busy. I, I that's okay. But um, yeah, I just felt that yeah, there is is room for improvement, and it's it's very crucial to acknowledge all visitors and guests, particularly international guests, and give them an appropriate welcome as a community. And and as I said earlier, hospitable actions are very important. So for example, inviting them to, to have meal together during the conference, sit together, or even like ask them, how are you? Are you enjoying the conference? Or, or something like that. So I think those efforts will make our community and our society more, much more open and welcoming. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Saya. So there's evidently some areas of learning uh, for us there, uh, for us to do better. And I really appreciate you bringing that up. Um, it's bringing to mind what um, Slats said during the earlier discussion panel, I think on Monday, uh, of having a, uh, tending to have a skepticism toward organizations that proclaim themselves as welcoming or who proclaim all are welcome um, because the welcome is complex and there's, uh, there's a lot to be learned. So thank you. I really appreciate you sharing that perspective. Um, I would just like to, I know that Lisa H has to jet <laughs> uh, and she's joined by an assistant. Uh, Lisa, thank you very much. If there's any last thoughts you'd like to share, you're welcome to or to say bye. Oh, thank you. Yes. Um, I, the, the, I really feel like I'm just picking up on themes that we have we have drawn on and just wanted to touch on a really quick one, which is kind of the um, intersectionality is messy and it, and it gets messier when you throw disability into it. I think from a disability perspective, one of the things I both love and I know, sweetheart, um, one of the things I both love and also 
recognize can be a challenge as we enter into that is mm -hmm. the recognition that disability can affect any other people group at any time, anywhere. Mm -hmm. Like it's kind of, it's this marginalized category of people, however you want to put that, but it, it also spans so many other identities. And so there's a joy to embracing the messiness and the fact that we're going to have to actually do coalition work to do the work together. But I think yes. that means letting go of really neat boxes. Like if I understand this one thing about you, I've understood you. Yes. Like boxes are really helpful because if they introduce, I know. Boxes are helpful as they introduce us to stories but the boxes don't get to become more important than people. And I think yes. um, that's true for any of the people groups that we all are part of and represent in our diverse communities. I just think that's one of the things that comes up often in my work with churches and others. Yes. Is <laughs> yes. Yes. And in embracing it and letting it be a challenge and that God is in the challenge and worth it. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Amen. Thank you so much. And Lisa, thank you for your time yes. and for everything you've shared today. Yes. Say thank you, Angus. Can you say bye-bye? Hi, Angus. Say bye-bye. Thank bye -bye. you all for your time and for the invitation and to the, all the other panelists. It was wonderful to meet and hear from you. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As we say bye to Lisa, who has things to do. Um, and, you know, I, I, I preface this by saying I have so many privileges that have meant that I have had a better time of the pandemic than uh, than many. But uh, being a parent of a toddler in a pandemic uh, has been um, has made me so enormously appreciative of the kinds of accommodations that we are using uh, for conferences. You know, being able to stay connected with with conferences, being able to still you know share my scholarship and connect with colleagues, and so. Um, Lisa is helping us see in real time how meaningful that is to many, many people um, during during the pandemic. But but well beyond the pandemic, it's it's uh, demonstrates that that access is is so needed by uh, by so many. Um, I mean, can, we, can I yeah. to that question before we shift? Please. The, the two things you, you you asked: what are we what um. What do we need to let go of, or you know, yes. what do we need to do? Um, I I don't have anything spe nothing specific mm. occurs to me, but rather more broadly, um, is we need to let go of coming up with answers that we don't have a frame of reference for. We need to ask the people what they need. Thank Sometimes you. Sometimes you know, um, and and I'm touching on some comments in the in the chat is that people presume a level of expertise, you know, all, all the PhDs are talking or all the, the longtime pastors are talking. And sometimes we need to ask the people themselves what they need. They know best um, what they need. And I think sometimes what we need to give up is self. I mean, we need to be canonic and, and you know, empty ourselves. Mm. We, need to, we need to do what Christ did to empty ourselves to welcome others. Um, Thank and you. so sometimes the biggest thing we can give up is our, our self um, to make way and space for others. Well said, thank you. Adam, do you have anything to add in this, on this question? Um, not, a, not a concrete thing, but a question that I'm, I'm sort of living with. Uh, you know, we, we often do so well to recognize that people feel welcome uh, when they hear their songs sung or, you know, when they, they have um, representation, I guess, it, it just to, to boil it down to, to that. Um, and the challenge it is, uh, as as those multiple identities and, and multiple constituencies expands to to yeah for everyone to feel represented um, mm -hmm. in some meaningful way. And again, uh, that's not a an answer um, more than it is just a question of um, yeah how how do we how do communities continue to navigate that? I mean, Frascuneo was a was a kind of a certain model. You know, multicultural worship uh, leaders have a certain kind of certain kinds of models for trying mm -hmm. to bring intersections together. Um, but uh, but yeah, it will remain a challenge um, in that question of not just uh, whose table. You know, some people like to ask, you know, 
but uh but how we yeah what accommodations to to speak in that language to um we make as a whole and for whom um is an ever-present question i guess yes i'm going to just look what's in the the chat and the q a but i want to ask while i'm doing that um what what question have I not asked today that you think the Hymn Society should be asking itself in its centenary year? And uh, I, I would love to hear in the chat or Q&A uh, answers to that or the panelists. What question have I not asked today that you think the Hymn Society should be asking itself in its centenary year? I'm happy to stir the pot here a little bit, <laughs> which is to say, how will the form of the hymn and the name of our organization continue to represent what it is that we do and want to do mm. in the next hundred years. Um, yeah, just leave it at that question. That's good, that's good. That's a good question. I don't have a question. I was, Adam, you're asking that question. It felt like you were in my head because the question, the, the, con the question conceptually that's rolling around is a question of liminality. Like, how are we transitioning, right? So maybe that's where that hymn question fits in. Like, is that word going to fit who we are in the next hundred years? How do we, how do we live in a liminal space um, as we move from one century to the next? And and yes, a lot of things have happened in the last century, but a lot of things have happened in the last 18 months, right? And so how do we move into the next century? Um, just keep thinking about liminality. Mm -hmm. Amanda Otis Kessler says, mm -hmm. could the hymn society become the society for sacred music? I'm only half joking. <laughs> What, uh, Peter Raywalt, what geographic places should we take our summer conferences to that we've not yet been to? Local voices are a huge part of these events for me and I miss it in this virtual conference. Yes, Peter. Anna, hi Anna. Anna Hernandez says, big question. And what are we becoming? Living into liminal space is my fave. My mine too, Anna. Carl Bear, what about beyond conferences such as publications, other events, et cetera? And, and yes, um, good question. Gloria Fancheng, how to be more accessible to those with economic challenges? Hugely important question. Thank you, Gloria. In the Q&A uh, feature here, just seeing this question from Sime. Hi, Sime. Um, which I think is a great question too. Like when should our voices be silent? Um, the kind of the inverse of <laughs> the normal question that we ask, how, how do we sing? Um, how do we, how and where, when be silent? Eileen Johnson asks, are we willing to take responsibility for self-educating ourselves about topics and issues rather than placing the major burden of educating on the other, whoever that may be in a given context? Thank you, Eileen. That's a hugely important question. Uh, and Brian Hain is asking, what would it look like for the Hymn Society to send out learning task groups to various places around the world to learn from others and report back to us? Sounds like Brian wants a free vacation. That's, that's what I hear. <laughs> just kidding <laughs> thank you ray thanks ray whitney that's lovely well friends uh this has been such a rich conversation and i know uh well i can i can picture how we would continue this conversation if we were uh together at the conference uh but uh, physically together but to be virtually together with you for this hour has been such a privilege and i'm so grateful for all of your perspectives and i will certainly be um thinking about them and reflecting on everything you've said as uh, the work of the executive continues through through this year and beyond so thank you Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Saya. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you, Lisa H., who has said goodbye already. Thank Hillary, thank you so thank much. You.
Um, and on behalf of the staff, uh, I just want to say we're, we're listening and I, I'm right. I'm writing things down and we're, we're right here with you and for you. Um, so keep dreaming, keep giving us ideas on how we can serve the society to bring, bring all of this to life. Um, and tomorrow during the same time, John Thornburg will be talking about our hundred year anniversary and this conversation will continue through, um, through his leadership. Um, so I hope you'll join us again, everybody tomorrow, um, for that session as well. And I look forward to seeing you all tonight for our evening hymn festival led by the folks in Grand Rapids, um, who were going to be our local hosts for this conference until we went digital. So thank you all and take care. Thank you.